Hi, let's get started. Um, just gonna say this now. Feel free to stop me at any point that I'm doing math if you wanna do it yourself and just make sure you have a calculator and a uh, reference table or periodic table handy. Uh, to get things started, I wanted to uh, play a bit of a video to show you a chemical compound and see how it behaves differently than what we've seen before. Oh, now that's cool. Okay. So just as a brief review, these are some things we've seen before. Uh, polar molecules, oxygen side being negative, hydrogen sign being positive of water, can interact with ionic compounds, and that's how you know ionic compounds dissolve into water. The attraction between the uh, positive end of water and the negative ions, and the negative end of water and the positive ions, allows the ions to be pulled away from each other and they can be free floating in water and then mobile and you get your conductivity. You, but you know, there's nothing to be said that this shouldn't work the other way around. You know, there's a lot of water when you dissolve salt in water, but what if there was relatively few water particles? Wouldn't there also be an attraction between chloride ions and sodium ions in a crystal too? And that's exactly what we saw in this video. Uh, hydrates are a subclass of ionic compounds that, in addition to existing as that plus minus plus minus crystal, there's a different way to put the crystal together that actually traps water in between the ions. Uh, this is a solid crystal. These, uh, these tennis balls are meant to be your positive and negative ions, and then here you've got your waters all surrounded, or here's another image that shows a, something similar in a different way. Uh, this is a solid crystal, so when we saw our original video, that pinkish purplish compound, that was the hydrated crystal. It was solid, it was a powder. Um, in the notation, we use a dot to separate the, uh, the water from the ionic compound. And it does turn out that the amount of water trapped in the crystal is always in a whole number ratio in terms of particles in relation to the salt itself. Uh, usually I've seen numbers between one and 12. I don't think they get much higher than 12. I'm just saying those, that's what I've seen. So that, that hydrated compound, this one is the hydrate up here, cobalt chloride. The waters are trapped inside the crystal, but it's based on that same molecule ion attraction, which means it's an attraction, not a bond. And because it's not a bond, this is almost like, almost partially considered a mixture in that you can get the water out from the ionic crystal through those physical separation methods, which is why it was heated. Uh, so covalent compounds have a much lower boiling point than ionic compounds, so the water can boil out, leaving behind the solid ionic compound. And when that's done, what's created is called anhydrous, meaning it was hydrated, but it's currently not. Here are some chemical formulas to show. Uh, another interesting point is that if the anhydrous uh, ionic compound contains a um, transition metal, the hydrate may have a different color. Usually it has a shinier crystal or a deeper color, and the anhydrous is usually a little paler. If, the, uh, if it contains a group one or two metal, obviously the compound is white, so it goes from being a white crystal to being a white crystal. It's a little bit more boring. 
Uh, what is interesting about this process is that, you know, since we can do that separation in the lab, if you have any of these crystals, uh, you can test it yourself. Um, Epsom salts or uh, root killer, if you have any in, around, I don't know that any of you would have root killer, but both of them are actually hydrated compounds. And you can do this, you know, in a safe environment outside. Maybe I'll record a video later to show that. <clears throat> but what is nice is if you can, in, in real life, if you can achieve the separation, through proper measurement, you could actually figure out these chemical compounds, these formulas yourself. We can't measure directly a number of moles with any sort of instrument, but we can measure mass, and I think we know how to relate mass back to moles. And so if you had had a scale in that previous example with the uh, copper two chloride, or cobalt two chloride, sorry, and weighed it before you heated it, and then weighed it after you heated it, you could tell how much water was removed from the crystal. And so then you can take those masses and relate to moles, divide by smallest. We, this, is, this sounds familiar. This is like what we did with, uh, with empirical formulas. And actually, that, yeah, that should work. Let's try that. Uh, so here's a, here's a sample problem. Like I said, pause if you want to do this yourself. Magnesium sulfate, we're going to need to translate that into a chemical formula, the magnesium is a plus two, the sulfate's a minus two. We see 13.52 and 6.60 is the anhydrous. So uh, the difference between them would be the amount of water, which in this case would be 6.92 grams of water. So again, our general formula is going to be this. We're looking for the N, and there's going to be a 1 understood in front of our anhydrous. So we're looking for a 1 to N ratio of moles. While we have the mass of the anhydrous and the mass of the water, we should convert both of those to moles. The molar mass for magnesium sulfate, of course, so you add up magnesium, uh, which is 24, plus sulfur is 32, plus oxygen is 16 times 4 is 64, and you get 120.4 grams per mole. And for the water, 0.384 moles. Uh, and so obviously the next step would be to normalize. We need to put whole numbers here. So we're going to divide both by 0 0.0548. And for the second one here, you're going to end up with 7. So our overall formula is MgSO4. Of course, you divide that by itself and you get 1.7 H2O. So that's your general procedure. If you want to try one, another one for yourself, here it is. Otherwise, I will start writing. Uh, sodium carbonate is Na2CO3. It says it loses. So in this case, they didn't tell you the anhydrous mass, so you had to figure that out. Again, we're going to convert to moles. I will say in most cases, since it's going to be a one to something ratio, that you should just divide by the mass, the uh, moles of the anhydrous. Yes, the moles of water is slightly lower here, but you know what? Even when we divide, it doesn't matter which one we divide by, I'm pretty sure we're going to get into that range where you get a 1 to 1 ratio, because this 0 0.0711 divided by 0 0.0714 is going to be close enough to 1. Our, our formula here would be this, where it's actually n here is 1. Um, this here, this is why it's super important to drag a couple of extra decimal points with you while you're doing the math, because you could easily see where rounding can make a big difference in doing your math. If that last digit changes, you get a little bit of variation, and then you might get a 2 or you're supposed to get a 3. Uh, and then finally, something to look at here is sometimes you'll get your, uh, your information presented to you in a composition by mass instead of a composition by, well, percent instead of by mass. And uh, just like we did before, you know, as long as we assume a 100 gram sample, this will just immediately become a gram measurement, which helps dramatically. So uh, we actually can jump straight to the mole conversion. This is 0 0.4201 moles of the anhydrous. And for the water, You'll see that over, over all these problems, the water step is always the same. You're always dividing by 18. You're just dividing by something different uh, in the case of the anhydrous, of course. Uh, and then again, we divide by the smallest, or if you want to just say as a rule, uh, the anhydrous moles of the ionic compound. And what you should get here is this is going to be equal to 6. Yeah, it's equal to 6.006, which, you know, again, 
This is going to be a whole number. We're well within our rounding. So our final formula is COCl2 with a dot 6 H2O. So that's, that's how you address these. You can go from measured masses or percentages all the way back to your chemical formula of your hydrated compound. Just as a, a brief stopping point for naming, um, the, the name of these compounds, you, you actually name the number of waters with a prefix. So that's cobalt to chloride hexahydrate, sodium carbonate monohydrate, and calcium chloride dihydrate. The whole thing is called a hydrate as a whole, but they have specific names. So just to sum things up, hydrates are a thing that can happen. Certain ionic compounds can trap water in their crystal structure. Usually this is when you get them wet and you let the water evaporate slowly so that as the crystal reforms, it traps your water. The trapped water can be heated out so you can carry out an experiment to drive off the water, compare the masses before and after, and figure out a whole number ratio of moles, much like you would with empirical formulas, to determine your chemical formula of your hydrate. Thanks for watching.